still waiting for a couple of uh, councillors uh, to take the seats. Uh, Councillor Kemp, you're in on this meeting now, aren't you? Is that is that correct? Sorry, George, I didn't quite catch what you said then. Press, press your button. Can you hear us now? Can you hear me now? Before we go on to item agenda eight, um, item agenda seven has been struck from the agenda, so we won't be uh, doing that one. So it will be going on to item agenda eight. We're just waiting for Sarah now. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome again to the development panel, uh, Aladale Borough Council, 6th of July, 2021. We move on to item agenda eight, which is uh, in front of the development panel, and it's uh, Victor Alpha Romeo Four slash 2024. Slash zero five zero seven. It's if not four on your agenda. So if I can ask the officers to make the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Speaker, okay. The mic, yeah. Thanks. Right. So to start with a little bit of back, you will recall from last development panel. Um, the council granted full planning permission for uh, an evaluation and test track centre at Dovenby Hall Estate for M Sport Limited. And a lawful start was made on that and the construction is, on, uh, is, is now complete. At the same time, the council granted outline planning permission for a future expansion space of 5,000 square metres, offices nearly 2,500 square metres, and a 60 bed hotel. Um, but the res no reserve matters application was made for that outline element of the scheme. So that, that development, that outline development has time expired, so it can't now be developed. So we've got the evaluation and test track constructed, but the remainder of that permission can no longer be built out. So if you just go to the third slide, Yvonne, please, that shows you the master plan. That was the um, original permission. So you'll see the pink building in the centre is the evaluation centre, and you can see clearly the test track facility. The pink building to the top left of the screen, that would have been the hotel. And then the orange building to the bottom left and the red building near that, that would have been the expansion space. So it's, it's the hotel and the expansion space and the offices that now won't, won't be developed under that uh, earlier permission. So the 2015 permission was subject to a number of conditions, uh, including condition 16 that we're here to consider today. Um, and that condition stated that prior to the occupation of the evaluation centre, uh, a refuge island and footway was to be provided at the A594 junction with the road to Brightkirk, uh, along with two request bus stops to the north and south of the A594. So if you could just see uh, the next two slides, Yvonne. So this... Um, this drawing is showing you the 
the refuge island and the footpath that was secured under that condition. So that would be to the immediate right of the access into M Sport as it is now. The refuge island would assist with crossing the road to the, the, the footpath on the other side. And the purpose of those were to make it easier to access the request bus stops. So if you just flick onto the next slide, please, Yvonne. So you'll see from this image that that's the entrance to the Dove and Behold estate on your left. The refuge island would have been in the hatched area that you can see in the middle of the road. And then the extra bit of pavement would have been on the grass verge immediately behind the red truck. So then if you can go to the previous note again and again. So then the other part of the condition was to secure an extension to the footway along the A594 where you go into the village. And it, at the moment that footway just peters out and there's a section of the junction where there isn't any footway at present. So if you click onto the Google Street View, you'll see that a bit more clearly. So it's a bit difficult because of the shadow, but if you can see on the very left, path gets narrow to a point where it disappears. And then as you go around the junction into Dovenby, there, there isn't a, an existing footpath. So the conditions secured an extension um, to the footpath that was shown in that previous previous drawing. So the application that we're considering today is made under section 73 of the Act and it requests removal of that condition 16 to secure with those highways work. So essentially the, the, the applicant is asking for permission without having to now implement the, the highways works that that condition secures. So when it doesn't it's not, we're not here to discuss the merits of the, of the scheme as it was originally proposed or the pr principle of the development. The focus of the decision is whether the highways works that were secured by that condition remain necessary to make the development acceptable. That's the test. Um, whether the works would deliver wider community benefits is not the appropriate test uh, for a planning condition. Conditions can only be lawfully used where, where they're necessary to make a development acceptable. So, as I've alluded to in the background, there has been a change in circumstances since that, uh, that condition was originally felt necessary. And that change in circumstances is the fact that the um, outline elements of the scheme haven't progressed. So when, when this application was considered back in 2015, we were considering the whole master plan and there are conditions appropriate to the full and to the outline. Uh, but now what we're left with is the fact that only the full elements of the scheme, so the test track and the evaluation centre have, have actually been built out. If they wanted to now progress the other elements that were subject of the outline permission, then that would now need a fresh planning permission, it would need a fresh application. So this, effectively, the scale of the development is a lot less than what was originally envisaged. So we've consulted um, in the normal way with the parish, with the public, and in particular with the highways authority. We have received concerns from the parish and some members of the public, and that's reported at section five of the officer's report. However, the Highways Authority has not raised any objection to the removal of the condition. You'll see that the responses from the Highways Authority are summarised at points five, point six, and to 5.10 of the officer's report to panel. And um, that includes a reconsultation because a member of the public put forward an alternative footpath um, that ran behind the wall that you can see on the left of the picture there, utilising part of the village green. They thought that would be a better route for the footpath than um, encroaching into the actual width of the road. 
So we did reconsult on that with the um, with the county council. But just to summarise their response, um, the highways response stated that the works to the west of Orchard House to um, provide the footpath wouldn't really comply with their normal standards. It would require the narrowing of the A594 where it's already a narrow section of that road um, in close proximity to two, two junctions and would also only allow for a footpath of 1.2 metre wide. And whilst that width would conform to minimum footway standards, it would have an un unacceptable impact on highway safety if it, if it resulted in the further narrowing of the road. Uh, they also noted that the current footway does lead, that serving M Sport does lead to um, bus stops and that they, are, they have the necessary drop curbs, et cetera, and they felt that was acceptable. They felt that there were possible potential safety concerns with the proposed traffic island that would have um, being required as part of the request bus stops. And they noted that the alternative pedestrian route put forward by a member of the public, whilst they felt that was a, a positive um, suggestion, they noted that it would require third party land and that they didn't actually feel it was um, Necess necessary in, in, or reasonable in relation to the development that we've now got as opposed to the development that we thought we were going to get when we had the, when we had the original permission. So turning to the officer's assessment, um, in, in relation to the bus stops and the associated refuse island and footway at the junction with the Brightkirk Road, the test track and the evaluation centre alone does have some potential to attract movements of mainly employees and visitors to the, to the new facility, to the evaluation centre and the test track. And vice versa, some of those employees or visitors might want to access perhaps the, the bus stops or the ship, um, which is really the only uh, facilities that, that Dovenby Village has. The refuge island and footway would assist pedestrians in crossing the road at the site entrance and accessing the originally secured request bus stops on the northern side of the carriageway. But you'll see from the officer's report that the entrance to the Dovenby Hall estate is already located only 200 metres from existing bus stops and that that's considered to be a reasonable walking distance for anybody visiting or, or employed at the, at the new evaluation centre and test track facility. Um, so on that basis, we, we don't really feel that the, um, that the request bus stops remain necessary because those existing bus stops are in such a reasonable distance. And because the, the refuge island and the pedestrian footway are interrelated to the request bus stops, they're only necessary because of the, the request bus stops, then it's officers and the highways authorities view that those works um, aren't really justified just for the evaluation centre and the test track because of the proximity of those existing bus stops. Uh, it's a very similar um, assessment of the footway where as well that would be extended to the junction with, with the main road into the village. The evaluation centre and the test track is considered to only gen, only likely to generate very small, a small amount of movement by foot. You, you, you're probably just looking at maybe people going across to the pub for lunch or after work or or going to the bus stops themselves because there aren't any other facilities within Dovenby that would attract move, foot movements by foot from the evaluation centre and the test track. And I, I mean, I, I don't have information as to whether any employees of, the, of Dovenby work in the village, but I, again, I would imagine that that wouldn't generate any a significant level of footfall. So again, the advice from the highways authorities that is that the level of
pedestrian movements that are anticipated from the evaluation centre and test track alone wouldn't now be sufficient to necessitate the securing of that deed of variation from all parties. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, any speakers, uh, Gail? So, sorry, Sarah. Yeah, we did have a representation down from Mr Ian Chambers, but he's since written his rep representations down, which we've got now. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, so I'll just, uh, yeah, Mr Chambers couldn't, couldn't uh, hang around, he had a, a meeting, so he's asked us to just um, read out his, his comments. So he said, while I appreciate that circumstances have changed since condition 16 was put in place, with redundancies and the scale down of the development reducing the anticipated head count on site, I can understand why the requirement for a new request bus stop and associated infrastructure is no longer deemed to be required. However, when the new facility does come along online, new hires will be made, and I'm sure all concerned, including the local enterprise partnership, who have granted 3.5 million to this project, will be eager to see the facility become a success by increasing the headcount on site. It is clear that the scale of works planned to satisfy condition 16 are no longer required. However, that doesn't mean that a scaled down scheme wouldn't be more appropriate. Without the proposed bus stop, future public transport users would now be expected to use the existing infrastructure. But as you can see from the photo displayed, which unfortunately I haven't. Oh, have we got that, Yvonne? Have we got? Oh, that's it. Right. So this is the bus stop on the westbound carriageway. So to the south of the year 594. Without, where was I? Yeah, but as you can see from the photo displayed, the current bus stop doesn't even have a roof. I don't know if any of you have ever stood at Dovenby bus stop, but it's quite an intimidating place. A very narrow pavement next to a fast flowing A road with poor visibility make it generally an unpleasant place to be. So much so that Cumbria Highways have recently run a consultation focusing on speed reduction on this section of the road. The officer's report says it is acceptable for public transport users from the estate to walk the 400 metres to the bus stop. OK, fair enough, but currently they would have to stand without shelter, close to very fast flowing heavy traffic in all weathers. I appreciate that this is a chicken and egg situation, but it is imperative that if we are to encourage folk to make use of the bus of public transport and therefore increasing demand for services, that we must make public transport an attractive option for potential users. With that in mind, I would ask that you direct the applicant to resubmit a revised scheme in replacement of condition 16 that would at very least increase the safe space and put a nice roof on the existing westbound bus stop, making it fit for purpose. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sarah. Right. Uh, what we'll do now, because it's not, you can't ask questions of a, a deposition, so we're, we'll go straight to uh, the officers can respond or question the officers. If you'd like to, uh, uh, this is for councillors, if you would like to question the officers on their presentation, uh, raise a hand. Right, no raised hands. So we can go to debate or a motion. <laughs> Councillor Kendall, let, uh, let's guess what's coming. Thank you, Councillor Kendall, and seconded by Councillor Lynch. Right, the motion on the table is for the officer's recommendation for the uh, M Sport um, application. So, those four. Those against? Abstainers? Two abstainers. So that's, was it top of mind? Chair, I, the, the vote there, I got eight in favour, none against, and two abstentions. Thank you, Gail. Yeah. Uh, the, so, sorry about that. The difficulty seeing raised hands is quite, is quite hard with these things. But uh, the motion was carried. Um, uh, the uh, motion's approved. Item agenda number nine. This is the development panel uh, application, uh, Foxtrot Uniform Lima, oblique 2019, uh, oblique 0160. It's the land opposite the Verona Bitterlees in Silleth, Wigton, Cumbria, and it's for five detached bungalows. And you'll find that information on pages 85 to 112. Thank you, Councillor Kendall. Can the officers speak on this subject, please? Have we got all the speakers in? They are here. The Catherine's just going to get them to come right. inside. Right. So we just give them a chance to get. Sorry for the delay, we're just waiting for the um, speakers to uh, arrive, just, just as a matter of uh, protocol to allow them to do so. so
Okay, if you can take your seats, uh, we'll start proceeding with agenda, uh, agenda item number nine. Okay, and it's the um, Foxtrot Uniform Lima, oblique 2019 0160, the land opposite uh, the Verona House, Bitterlees, Silla, Wigton, Cumbria, and it's for five detached bungalows. If I can ask Sarah to speak. Thank you. So, some members might recall that this application was originally considered at development panel on the 1st of October 2019. Um, a decision on the application was deferred pending concerns raised by members of the public relating to localised flooding and standing water at the site and having received a late response from the uh, local lead flood authority requesting further information in relation to those um, suggested issues of flooding and surface water. So since that time, uh, there have been a number of revised flood risk assessments and, and plans submitted to the council, um, which have been subject to reconsultation, including with the Environment Agency, United Utilities, and the County Councils, the Flood Authority. Uh, following the submission of further revised plans and documents in April this year, the Environment Agency, United Utilities and the Local Leave Flood Authority have now all withdrawn their objections to the scheme, subject to conditions that secure the mitigation measures contained within the flood risk assessment and secure implementation in accordance with the various drainage drawings that, that we've received. So on that basis, we're now reporting it back to, um, to members. So what, what I've done is we have updated the report where, where that's been necessary because of certain changes with the development plan. Questions were asked about heritage at the last meeting. So that section's been updated. And obviously the drainage section has been updated as well. So just as a recap, the um, permission is sought for five bungalows. If you can just skip on to the... Um, the Maybe the next, that's great, thanks Yvonne. So, permission is sought for five bungalows at the northern end of Blitterlees and to the east of the B5300. The scheme utilises an existing access, uh, field access, which I think you can, you'll see if you um, flip onto the photos, we'll, we'll see that in a second, but you can see that it's a, a linear pattern of development reflecting the opposite side of the road. Um, so all the houses are facing onto the main road there. What you possibly can't make quite out quite on that is that the Blitterlees Beck runs to the front of the site. So it runs along the, um, the big five, 300. So if you just flick through the photos, Yvonne. So this is um, a proposed street scene. So that's the five proposed bungalows. And then this is where you enter the site at the moment. That's through the field gate. So the site, uh, sorry, that's the, oh. so that's, um, that's the very northern end of the site. And then the, the remainder is the, of the site is as you would pan round to the right of that photo. The next one is looking at um, the frontage. Can we just skip on to, through those? So that's looking south from the access. So you can just make out the um, Blitterlees Beck there, um, the ditch running uh, between the verge and the, the hedge. And that's the existing field gate. Is that the last one, Yvonne? Yeah, okay. So section six of the officer's report sets out that objections have been received from Home Law Parish Council and a number of residents. And, and those concerns are, are maintained even after we, we receive the revised package of information in April. But no other consultees are now maintaining any objections subject to those conditions um, to secure the flood risk measures and the drainage. So very quickly, because we've got, well, we have obviously gone through these before at panel, but it was a long time ago. 
And the principle, in terms of the, whether the principle of housing at this location is acceptable, the site has benefited from outline permission in 2017, and, and that was within the current plan period. So it was assessed against the policies of part one and found to be acceptable. But that permission has now expired. It's expired whilst we've been getting to the bottom of the flood risk issues. Um, so the, the principle of development has already been accepted under the current plan. Litterlees is a limited growth village within our settlement hierarchy. So it's required to take a small scale of development um, in order for all of those limited growth villages to provide 6% of the housing growth for the borough. So the site now falls within the defined settlement limit of Litterlees as defined by the part two plan. And it's also identified as a housing commitment, and that's resulting from that previous uh, planning permission. The, the proposal is considered to be small scale and well related to the village and of an appropriate density. It'll, it'll continue that linear pattern of, uh, of, of the village that, that you can see in Blitterlees. So the principle of housing is considered to accord with part one and part two of the adopted plan. The other um, issues that have been considered in the report include landscape and visual amenity and, and the reasons why we find that acceptable have been set out at section 12 of the report. Residential amenity, um, there's not considered to be any harm there. There's adequate separation with housing opposites. Um, ecology issues had, had been considered as part of that previous report and the, and the well, there's no real update in that respect. And then the Highways Authority has raised no objection um, in terms of the access and the visibility that can be achieved and so forth. Section 12.33, there's an update provided in relation to heritage on the basis that um, it was questioned at the last panel about an 18th century cottage being in this locality. So, we have rechecked our mapping system, which has all the constraints on such as listed buildings and things. Um, and there isn't any there isn't any listed building within that locality. There is a traditional dwelling to the south of the site, um, which has a detached single storey stone out building to the side with a corrugated roof. Those structures aren't listed. And whilst traditional in construction and appearance, we didn't feel that they were elevated above other traditional buildings in, in the locality that would warrant them being given any kind of local um, listing designation. And what I would what I would point out is that yes, there are traditional buildings, but there there are modern buildings, there are modern houses in this locality as well. So I wouldn't necessarily see the construction of five dwellings there changing the setting particularly of those traditional buildings anyway, because there's already that mix. So bringing us on to flood risk and drainage, um, the latest flood risk assessment for the site includes a number of mitigation measures, which have been su summarized at section 12.29 of the report. These include uh, a restricted rate of discharge into the adjacent beck, which would be controlled by a hydro break and would utilise underground storage tanks so that the outfall to the beck would be restricted to four litres a second. Sewer connections are proposed to be fitted with non-return valves so that in the event of a flooding, that should control any um, comeback from the sewers into the site. It also includes reprofiling of the land to ensure that the new dwellings will be set at 7.72 metres above ordnance datum, which gives a free board of just over half a metre above the, the sewer manhole levels. And they're also proposing finished ground levels around the dwellings to be set at 7.5 EOD above ordnance datum, which is just over a 200 mil freeboard around the footprint of the houses. 
And then there's some further um, designs within that section of the report to address the access. And what the flood risk assessment concludes is that those various measures will keep the dwellings themselves free of the ingress of any flood water and would allow safe entry and exit from properties via the rear driveways and access road for residents and any emergency services that need to access the site. The flood risk assessment also confirms that the developer is willing to carry out works necessary to clean and restore the, the beck, the watercourse, where that extends for the length of his development. So that would include removing any silt and debris, uh, reprofiling the beck to its original uh, channel, um, cross-sectionally and longitudinally, and cleaning out the culvert that currently goes under the access road. As I said earlier, the submission of that revised information in, in April has now meant that the Environment Agency, United Utilities and the Flood Authority at the County Council um, have been able to confirm that they have no, no more objections to the scheme subject to conditions that secure those, those measures. Um, and there's an additional condition put forward on the late list, which um, is to secure the actual works to the Beck itself. And that, that's on the late list because that stemmed from a further bit of dialogue with um, colleagues at the County Council, just to clarify that that was definitely a necessary part of the mitigation works that we needed to secure. So the recommendation is is with the conditions in the officer's report, plus the additional condition that's um, been included on the late list. So based on the advice of the technical consultees and subject to the recommended conditions, um, officers feel that the flood risk and drainage issue um, has been addressed. And it's on that basis that the recommendation is for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sarah. Gail, the speakers, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. So our first speaker, we have Jeff Downham. If you'd like to come forward, please. You'll have five minutes if you just let me know when you're ready to start. And to use the microphone, just press the button in the centre. And when you finish speaking, deselect, yeah. OK. Yep. OK. Yeah. Ready to start, yeah. Uh, this application hinges on there being a suitable flood risk assessment following the panel's decision to request one at its meeting in October 2019. The original application for this development was submitted in July 2016 with outline planning consent approved in February 2017. Five years later, this matter is still being pursued to develop a site that no local builder would touch, presumably due to the site's unsuitability for development due to the large amount of flood water that the site regularly holds, as can be seen from the photographs. This new full application was considered by the panel in October 2019, where the decision was made to defer any decision until a full flood risk assessment was completed. Since that date, four flood risk assessments have been submitted by the developer, with the first three failing to meet the requirements as set out by the flood authorities, and the fourth still containing inaccurate information as to how the water from the site will be disposed of. Each flood risk assessment has been both misleading and inaccurate in its assessment of the flooding issues at this location, as detailed in mine and other residents' comments submitted following the last uh, flood risk assessment in May of this year. The main issue with regards to this application is this dispersal of water from the site, which according to the developer would be discharged into the water course adjacent to it. In the developer's own words, this water course has fallen into disrepair, some would say abandoned. The report states that the bed of the stream and the culverted lens of the watercourse are silted up, causing a significant reduction in the capacity of the surface water drainage of the area, leading in turn to the backing up of flows onto the highway and other adjacent land, but says nothing about how this will be addressed, other than to say that it is an obligation on the owners of the watercourse to carry out these works and to maintain flows through the system. The report also states that significant 
The works have been carried out to restore and regrade parts of the existing open sections of the watercourse, suggesting that it is hoped that these works will be extended to cover all areas of the watercourse that have been neglected over many years. No work has been carried out to restore or regrade any section of the watercourse. A section of the road outside the development site was last year upgraded as the road was subsiding into the beck and was recognised by the highways authorities that it was a danger to road users following complaints from the public. United Utilities raised the issue of flotation of the water tanks due to the high water table at this location. That does not appear to have been addressed, even though it is also mentioned in the flood authority report, again, with no action to address this. There, there also appears nothing in place to address the risk of flooding elsewhere, as outlined in the report by the Environment Agency. One of the foul sewer manhole covers outside the proposed site regularly overflows now, as, it can, as, as can be seen by the attached photographs. How can it take the additional water discharge from this site if it were to be de developed as the application? The flood authorities are now satisfied that this latest attempt at a flood risk assessment is adequate, but it only relates to water being dispersed from the site. Nowhere does it address the condition of the water course where all the water will be fed into. When the beck is full now, the water soaks away over a number of days when the rain stops. It does not flow. The fact remains that with no flow on this water course due to the poor state of it, and no plans by the applicant nor anyone else to address this, in periods of heavy rain, the beck will continue to overflow, and should this application be approved, will overflow to a much greater extent, putting properties on the other side of the development at risk together with users of the highway. I would argue that this application should be regretted on the grounds that this latest flood risk assessment does not answer the considerable issues surrounding the dispersal of water from the site, and without this water course being upgraded along its entire length, which it appears there are no plans to do, thereby allowing any additional water to be drained into it to be dealt with effectively, then I would ask that the panel consider refusal of this application. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. If you can remain seated, um, we're going to give councillors the opportunity to ask you some questions. So if I can ask any of the councillors, uh, if they want to ask questions, raise their hand, please. No questions, so you can return to your seat. And before the next uh, uh, speaker uh, comes up, uh, we'll clean the uh, workstation. Right, thank you, Chair. The next speaker we have down is Lynn Downham. Thank you. You two have five minutes, and if you just let me know when you're ready to start. Press the centre button when the red light comes on, you're on. Yeah. Hi. Uh, the background of Little is that it's not a village. It is more a suburb of Silleth with a continuous line of development on one side from Silleth into Blitterlees. It shares services with Silleth and it has no centre, no services, no church, no village green and it is nothing like what is described in this application. It is more of a hamlet than it is a village. Blitterlees within its current boundary has 49 houses. A development of four houses were approved in 2018 at the south end of the village and that site has now been completed. Should this application be approved for a further five houses, that would bring the total to nine, an increase of almost 19% on the current housing stock. That is hardly a small scale development in a limited growth village and far exceeds what should be expected of a community this size in achieving the 6% housing as quoted in the local plan for limited growth in villages. Three traditional stone built dwellings overlook this site, an 18th century clay dabbing cottage, two traditional farmhouses, but this application does not show photographs of any of these buildings, but show photographs of more modern dwellings further afield and not overlooking this site. Therefore, not giving the panel members a true picture of the visual impact of this development. And I also note from the officer's report that Councillor Markley welcomes this application in support of additional housing as if his endorsement should have some influence on this matter. As he was the original applicant for outlawing planning permission on this site, 
and he either still owns or recently owned this land, you could argue that he has a vested interest in this application being approved. Surely his comment should have no bearing on this application. I have no, no objections to further sustainable development in Blitterly in the right place, but this application is a large scale development in this location and its design, appearance, layout and material make it inconsistent with its surroundings and would be a loss of a very important green space. Thank you. Uh, before we go to questions, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, Councillor Markley's involvement, whether he says something or he's got any involvement in it, has, had, has, has no planning um, requirement whatsoever. Um, so if uh, councillors would like to ask questions of the uh, uh, speaker. Okay, no questions. Thanks very much. If you can take your seat, please. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, speaker we have down is Councillor John Graham, a representative of Home Law Parish Council. If you'd like to come forward, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is my name is John John Graham, Chairman of Home Law Parish Council. I'm just about getting sick and tired of coming to these planning applications for this site. As I've stated every time, it is totally impossible to build houses on this site because I've lived or been involved in Britterlees all my life. I'm 83 years old and the first time I visited that farm, which my family was on, I was five years old. I went with my father on bicycles because in those days there was no motor cars, the only mode of transport was bicycles or horse. On that occasion, there was a flood. The cattle in the byre were standing up to the bellies in water. It took it two or three days before it subsided. And since then, there's been quite a large number of floods at the same place. And it is about five years now since the last one, but nature always repeats itself. So that means it is five years nearer the next one. And that site, stands between three and four feet deep depth of water so any idiot believing they can build on that site would have to put the ground foundations of those houses at least four foot above the present ground level and a lady at one of the planning meetings when we, i asked about what she's going to do about the waters she said we will put holding tanks in now, I estimate that on that site, there is a minimum of 8 million gallons of water when the floods come. So which, which universe or anywhere can make tanks to hold water of that capacity? I wouldn't like to find them. And anyone buying houses on there would definitely have to own a canoe to get into them or rely on the lifeboat station to get them in and out. The, the uh, application says what is going to happen. As you've heard in the previous speakers, nothing has been done to try and alleviate the water away in different courses. One part of the, big, the river goes through a farmer's field, whom I have spoken to on a number of occasions, and he says he will never clean that gutter out, or bake, whatever he may call it, 
because the river authority always cleaned it out and then, then they disowned all those rivers round about our area, left them up to someone else to clean out. They've never, a lot of them has never been cleaned out since that day and they're all a disgrace. And the application for uh, houses on that highway, the, when I was a boy, there wasn't a road there. It was just a truck. And there was all the cattle in Brittany's from seven far little farms walked down that truck every morning to the pond for a drink and then walked back half, at half hour intervals. But when the authorities decided to put sewer into Brittany's, they put it right up the center of the road. They filled the pond most of the pond in so that tackle heavy vehicles had come into then motor cars and little jowered vans and such like and so to make it safe for them traveling along the fill part of the pond in which is now a little thereby and yet no matter what we say i've seen this all my life i don't believe these people from wherever they come from applying for this planning permission I've ever lived or been at Blitterlees, and they have definitely never been when there's been a flood. And as it, you were told earlier, how many times it's flooded in the past number of years. In, in over 80 years, I've seen it flooded. I wouldn't like to have up how many times. And when it comes, it just comes suddenly, and no one would have time to move anything or get out. And I think anybody who votes in favor of this planning should think of themselves they may at some time in the future be come on for liability of passing plans of houses that's going to be flooded unless they ensure that they are built on stilts and the uh, that's that's your five minutes if uh, thanks for your eloquent uh, deposition if if um you can remain seated uh, if any councillors have got any questions if they can raise their hand please Uh, no questions. So if you can uh, take your seat, please. Thanks very much. Okay, so there's no more speakers. Um, what we'll do is um, open this up to the officers to respond to the uh, speakers. No response. Okay. okay, so what we'll do now then is open it up to uh, um, councillors to question the officers, if you wish, about any um, planning matters. Councillor Lynch. Um. The speakers spoke of um, where the water was disposed to. Now, looking at the report, um, and, and just to clarify, the um, the access road is going to be fully porous, so that the the the, the water goes through. There, there, there will then be attenuation tanks, and is it my understanding that in the attenuation tanks? They release the water out at a at a certain rate when when um, when they're flooded. The hydro break controls the the rate at which water can be released from the site. So it's held up in the tanks, and the hydro break controls how much water can flow out at a time. And the drainage design is designed to a one in a hundred year flood event to accommodate um, and that's what the national policy requires was it requires a one in a hundred year event to be covered plus 40 percent climate change and then that water would go out into the water course and the other um, 
things on the um, on the plan and, and additions are that the um, the applicant is going to do remedial works on that watercourse, but just in the front of where they are. Now, whose responsibility is it to do any remedial works either side of that? Because the the, gent the last gentleman said that who, who you know whose responsibility is it to clean? Is this a river? Is it a ditch or what? It, it is a watercourse, not just a ditch. And whose responsibility is it to, to do the other sort of clearing out either side? So it's classed as a main river, um, which means the Environment Agency has um, control over permitting works to the watercourse because of that definition as a main river. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've got Peter here from the County Council, or Simon, as you know. Um, but I've, my understanding is still that the riparian owners have the responsibilities for maintaining the watercourse. That... Yeah, it's, that's correct. Um, but obviously, the Environment Agency have a a a a, a, a given to a control to ensure that it is uh, at a, 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 a the volume is maintained. The, the, the ability of the watercourse to deal with that capacity is maintained, so they actually do have a a, a hand to legally require those riparian owners to undertake those works. Happy, Councillor Lynch. Uh, any other questions, Councillor Daniels? Uh, thank you, Chair. Actually, I'd like to make a motion that we grant permission um, and accept the officer's uh, recommendations of conditions. Thank, thank you, Councillor Daniels. Uh, can we have a seconder? Any seconder? We have a seconder. Seconder, Councillor McGuckin. Uh, just before we go to the vote, I, I've just got one quick question for the officers. It's, there was an, uh, um, it was alluded to about the um, Hamlet village status and the uh, Allerdale Part 2 plan. How, do, how does that slot in with the Part 2 plan? Just to expand on that slide. Well, as I set out in my presentation, it, the site falls within the settlement limit under Part 2 and the village is required to um, take a certain percentage of housing growth. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, five up to five dwellings is considered to be small scale and officers didn't really feel that the five would, um, would be excessive in terms of the hamlet. Um, one of the speakers there has referred to another permission in Blitterlees also, I have done that calculation. I don't know if the 19% correct, but um, but it being in the settlement list as a housing commitment, then that that has already been through our local plans process and 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 has been accepted for the village. So, um, it, in my opinion, it, it wouldn't be um, excessive in relation to the village. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, Councillor Kemp, I didn't. Go ahead. Microphone, if press the centre. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, well, just looking at the pictures on there, you know, then you see the flood, and obviously the pictures have been taken at times when it has been really heavy rain. I mean, to me, to build houses, on a site that looks like that is utterly ridiculous, you know, and, and to see the water at the moment is actually going into the sewage system. It, this is going to be a carnage. When you build houses with roofs, driveways, roadways in, that only stores more water, you know, so I'm very concerned about this development and uh, I think we uh, should really look at look at what we do with it because I think it's you know we should be building houses in areas that are not susceptible to flooding we've seen all the flooding in the county you know and to me this is uh, a disaster waiting to happen thank you thank you Councillor Kemp uh, Councillor Lynch I was on the development panel that looked at this recently uh, and we were uh, as Councillor Kemp says we were concerned about the flooding as well which is why we asked for um, a full flood assessment and that has now come forward 
I, I feel that it, it is quite robust. There's a number of different measures there, um, including things like a French drain and a kid, which I had no idea what it was. Um, and had to seek clarification, but these are all measures to mitigate the flooding. And I, I'm, I'm again quite confident that the Environment Agency, United Utilities, and the local lead flood authority have been robust in in their investigations, coming up with a, 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 a very long list of of conditions that the that the developer is going to have to have to do. Uh, and I feel that those flooding issues have been addressed. Thank you, Councillor Lynch. Uh, any more contributions to debate before we go to uh, a vote? Okay, so the motion, second uh, motion from, uh, I can't remember who, who raised the motion, Councillor Daniels, I think it was, and uh, seconded by Councillor McGuckin, um, is for uh, item. Uh, nine on the agenda, FUL uh, 2019-0160, and that's to accept the officer's recommendation to grant permission uh, subject to the conditions there in the agenda. So those for the motion, uh, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against? Any abstentions? The motion was carried by seven votes to two. The application has been approved, uh, granting permission subject to conditions. Can we take a, a, a few minute break? Uh, we want to do just a little bit of admin. Okay.
Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Right, we're going on to now item agenda 10, development panel. It's a Foxtrot Uniform Lima, oblique 2021, oblique 0006, Durham Road, Maryport, and it's for two dwellings, and you can get the details on pages 113 to 126. Okay, if I can ask the uh, Simon to do the officer's presentation. Thank you, Chair. I'm actually going to... Uh... Just refer to the, um, the screen and actually use that as a, a prop for talking through this application. So this application, we see from the officer's report that um, there's three members who called in the application, one of whom was uh, Councillor McCarran Holmes. Um, for, there was two reasons specified. One was um, about access arrangements, which we'll come on to in a second with the slides. And then the second one was in relation to um, the settlement limits. And I just wanted to nip that one in the bud first. It is reported in, in, in the officer's report. But I think councillors, the councillors who called in the application referred to the 1999 settlement limits, which was obviously the old local plan, which was superseded in the summer of last year by the part two local plan, the 2020 part two local plan. So just for clarification members, the site is within the settlement limits for the part two local plan. And obviously being within the settlement limits of the part two local plan, it's in accordance with the development plan, the adopted plan. It's within a key service center as defined by policy S3 of the local plan part one. So it, it's it's an area which is expected to take um, development and growth. So the site, people know um, the road, Deerham Road between Maryport and Deerham. As, you're, as you pass through um, Ellenborough and the road starts to sweep up in that cutting with the uh, hedges on either side, with the, the bank on the right hand side, it's just past the, the, the last dwelling on that right hand side as the road climbs up towards Deerham. So this is so on this screen here, Maryport and the, the rest of Maryport is here. There's a, an existing house called um, Brooklyn's on the opposite side of the road. Interestingly, its garden is outside of the settlement limit. We have We've had uh, applications there, but there is a difference between the two sides of the road. And the two dwellings proposed here are inside the uh, settlement limits. So they are aligned along the frontage. One access is proposed, one vehicular access, and then it splits um, to branch left to one dwelling, right to the other. And although it's not shown on this plan, the intention is to retain the boundary hedge which exists and the, 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 the bank that's on the, on the front. And that's quite important as we roll the slides forward. The next slide, please, Yvonne. 
because when you look at this plan singly on its own, it does appear at first sight as a, a large three-story dwelling. What the plan doesn't um, express very well is a the right the, the the banked land. So when you get to the the back, you're really only talking about a two-story dwelling. And also, oh, let me just go. Um, yes, that's very well shown in that section. Thank you, Yvonne. And just going back to that previous slide, when you actually will view the the dwellings from the road, the hedge and bank will actually hide um, most of that ground floor. So you'll actually only see um, the, the 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 first and second stories. Although it is accepted by officers that there is it is a, a balanced consideration here um, because it is the fringe of Maryport. It is inside the settlement limits, and and the massing. When you look at it here, it is quite significant, despite the fact that the the um, the agent has tried to reduce the impact through the different use of materials, the gable and also the retention of the frontage landscaping, which is not readily apparent on this image. Um, next slide, please, Ron. So I say, these are, this is the, the section which shows that difference in the land. And then, so the road is here, and the, the landscaping sits here. Both dwellings basically um, are the, the same in terms of their massing. Next slide, please. And that's, we can show the similarities between the two. Next slide, please. And again. So this is, this shuts it, it's quite poor definition, but it show the, the, the land as it rises up from the road level. So it's a quite a distinct bank. And the, the applicant is utilizing that topography to build into that bank to reduce that overall massing. Next slide, please. And that shows it again with the existing dwelling in, in the background and that slope of land away from the road, which is here. Next slide, please. Now we're at road level and you can see the, the, the extensive screening, some of which will be lost to get that vehicle access in and the, vis and the associated visibility space because you are on the inside of the, the, of the curve. But you can achieve those visibility displays within land and the applicant's control and also keep the vast majority of this front screening and, and, and that is that's controlled through through the conditions although and here the road at this juncture is is part of the 40 mile an hour link between uh, Deerham and Maryport between the 30 mile an hours of, of the two places uh, next slide, please. So that's looking exactly straight at the, the, the access. This is the A594 in, in the foreground, the main road between Cockermouth and Maryport. Next slide, please. And so this, it's a very dim image, but you're now looking up the hill towards Deerham with the site on the right-hand side. There is some sheds and a static caravan, uh, which are next to the site at the moment. Next slide, please. And that's just a view pulling back, but on that, on, on that same view going towards Deerham with the site up here in, behind those trees. So the reports before members, I say it's recommendation for approval. It's, it is full application, so it is in uh, detail. It is a detailed application, and there are conditions in place to ensure there is safety. Uh, egress and um, ingress into the uh, site. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, Gail, any speakers? No, Chair, no speakers for this application. Okay, councillors, have you any questions for the uh, officer's report? Councillor McCarran Holmes. It's not a question, Chairman. I just want to. Put uh, can you move your microphone just uh, closely to you? I've got my light on. Can you hear me now? Um, I just want to put things into perspective for the committee. 
Um, I called this in as the county councillor for this ward, not as the borough councillor. And my reasons was the ingress and the egress at the time. However, at the bottom of page 118 and at the top of page 119, I feel heartened now by what has been said and by the presentation by the planning officer today. Um, it is a busy road, quite a busy road. Um, so that was my, my, the basis of my concerns regarding egress and ingress on this. But I feel heartened now. Thank you, uh, uh, Fanny. Uh, anybody else uh, want to speak? Raise hand. Uh, Councillor McGuckin. Thank you, Chair. Can I grant permission, uh, mo move a motion to grant permission to subject to conditions, please? You can. And have, have we got a second? Uh, Councillor Lynch. OK, we'll go straight to the vote. Um, the recommendation by the officers, if I remember, the recommendation is this development is permitted as defined by the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Order of 2015. Oh, sorry, I think it's the wrong one. Apologies. He's already got... <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Andrew Seekins, have you got a roof then? Right. Um, what I'm... Uh, the proposal is to grant permission subject to conditions for this uh, motion by Councillor McGuckin, seconded by Councillor Lynch. Those for the motion. Those against. Abstains. Carried unanimously. Motion to grant permission subject to conditions. And finally, we move on to agenda item 11, development panel, and this is Charlie Lima, Delta Papa, I believe 2021, Lake 0002, and it's three Honister Drive in Cockermouth for a new porch, and you can find the details on pages 127 to 130. Over to the officer's report. Yeah, very quickly, uh, Chair, I won't take uh, much of the members' time. So this application is being brought to um, panel because the, the, the applicant is, is a officer of the council. Um, the application is not a planning application, so members are not considering the merits or otherwise. It's an application to, to, to determine whether the development proposed is permitted development as defined by the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Order. And as you can see from the officer's report, officers have determined that it would be permitted development, and therefore does not necessi necessitate an application for planning permission. Planning permission is deemed to have been granted. So um, in the unlikely event you want to debate this matter, I'll just caution members that you're not considering the merits or otherwise, you're basically determining that whether it's permitted development or not. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Simon. Um, I don't think we need to go to debate. If you want to, you can. You can raise your hand, but I, I feel that we can move this on. I think it's been very clearly explained by uh, Simon. So I will put forward the motion for this um, recommendation that the development is permitted as defined by the Town and Country Plan in General Permitted Development Order of 2015 as amended and a certificate of lawful development can be issued as recommended by the planning department. And seconded by Councillor McGuckin. Those for the motion. Thank you. Interesting, I'd like to see those <laughs> against. Anybody against? None. And no abstentions. No abstentions. The motion's carried. <laughs> Thank you, uh, everybody. It's been a very long day, but I've appreciated your professionalism. Thank you very much. And we'll see you again. What's, what's the next meeting?